Here we go. But, but, we're going into Speak, Southwestern College. Just like always, there's a leaf blower. I can never escape noise pollution, but uh, we're going to go in and give a presentation today, and uh, it's going to be blunt. It's going to be fun. I'm going to share it with you. I'm just going to real quickly go um, tell the other classes you're here. Perfect. Wow. Hi, everybody. You're Hi. being YouTubed right now. <laughs> you will all be recorded. You'll never, ever receive any money for this. <laughs> And you will all be on YouTube. <laughs> Alright, YouTube. I'm about to rock you guys. Hi guys. Are you recording yet? Mm-hmm. Andale muchacho. That one's recording. Yeah, okay, it's not a very good angle. It's getting my it's getting my it's getting my fat side. This is what you can to the audience. Alright, so hi guys, my name is Jason Lanier. I am uh, well me. Um, I am a crazy dude. Uh, I do crazy things. Um, I shoot all over the world. I feel like all special because I feel like I'm in a spotlight, but it's just a projector. <laughs> um, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in Hollywood. Um, but uh, maybe some of you guys know who I am, maybe some of you don't. Um, for those who don't, uh, you should know something about me. I am um, crazy. Um, I um, am one of, the, one of the photographers out there, one of the few photographers out there that actually will tell you exactly what you want to know. I have an absolute no BS approach, um, and I say things that offend people, so I'm just warning you now. I don't say things that offend you if you're, your race or your religion or, or uh, you know, what color hat you wear, but um, I tell people things that I think they need to hear, and I speak from my personal experience. I, I speak from what's worked for me over the years and what hasn't worked for me. I am an absolute open book. There are no secrets. Um, I, I don't, I believe that there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of misinformation is a, is, a, is a nice way to put it that goes on in our, in our industry. I feel like a lot of uh, pros, um, <laughs> whenever I'm pausing, I'm trying to figure out how much trouble I'm actually going to get in based upon what I'm about to say. But I, a lot of pros, um, well some pros, I'll put it that way, uh, present themselves in a way that I don't think is, is, uh, accurate and one of the main reasons dang there's I love it there's a lot of a lot of you guys here um, one of the main reasons that uh, I choose to speak out is because I think it really does a disservice to you guys um, I, I, I think that it sets you on a wrong path and uh, people you know my assistant Joyce says all the time that uh, I have a chip on my shoulder um, and 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 I do I do have a chip on my shoulder and the reason I have a chip on my shoulder is because um, you know People fed me BS, um, you know, when I was a newer photographer. And I always, I always made a point to myself if I was ever standing in front of you guys or standing on a Sony stage or standing wherever I'm standing, uh, I wanted to be able to disseminate information to you guys as clearly as humanly possible. Uh, so with that being said, um, we have a presentation today. Hopefully we have audio to go with the presentation. The but audio's on that one. No, I'm not talking to you. Uh oh. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you'll see me today interacting with my little elves. Uh, this is Joyce. She's my main assistant. <laughs> this is Frodo Baggins. Um, <laughs> and uh, he is, uh, he's here to help. But uh, um, one, one thing I, I, I'm very big on, guys, is uh, I, I love interactivity with my, with my audience, whoever I'm speaking with. Um, you know, feel free to ask questions. I don't want this to be a lecture. I want it to be a give and a take. I want you guys to be able to pick my brain and I want you to be able to um, really kind of get inside of there and understand what I'm trying to communicate to all of you. So today we're going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is um, the difference between being a picture taker and a photographer. Um, I'm going to be pretty blunt today. Um, our industry is full of picture takers, absolutely full of picture takers, and I'm sick of it. Absolutely sick of it. You guys, look at websites, right? Yeah. I shoot all sorts of stuff. I shoot weddings. I shoot National Geographic stuff. I shoot 
fashion, I shoot architecture, urban ex exploration. We'll get into how I do all these you know, crazy things that you're not supposed to do. You're only supposed to pick one genre, right? Um, but uh, let's talk about wedding websites for a second. What do you see on, on the vast majority of wedding websites? What do you see? Wedding photographers' websites, what do you see? Uh-huh. Yes. Um, and what do you, what, a, what a, you know, it's weird. I don't know how I've done it, but I have this ability to make Earth actually look like Earth. <laughs> you guys notice that? You notice that, you know, so many other photographers, it's like we're on an alternate universe where all the skies are white, all of them are blown out, and look like crap. Okay, it's crap. And I'm tired of it. You know why I'm tired of it, guys? I'm tired of it because com photographers complain ad nauseum about how we can't make money. You know why you can't make money? You can't make money because you're not taking better pictures than the person with an iPhone. It's the truth. How do you expect to charge someone more money? How do you expect so to charge somebody $5,000 to shoot a wedding when your pictures look like something out of an iPhone? It's the absolute truth, and that's what I really want to convey to you guys right now. I, we're going to talk a lot about that. About that. So um, let's get on with the presentation. All right. All right, guys. All right, everybody. We're ready to go.
All right, guys, what's a picture taker? person who just takes a picture. No purpose. Doesn't put no any purpose. Purpose. Uh -huh. Who said auto mode? I like you. Is that what you call the green box? Yeah. yeah. What's a picture taker? Who's a picture taker? Anyone can take a picture. A two year old kid can take a picture. Okay. I want you guys to think about that. The world is full of picture takers. Virtually everyone on this planet is a picture taker. We're in Ethiopia where we would assume that kids have never, you know, had much, they haven't had much contact with cameras or technology. And you saw there I had a shot. I mean, they were grabbing the phone out of my hands and they were learning to take pictures. Anyone's a picture taker. My boys, from the time they were, I have triplets, from the time they were little, they're picture takers, right? Anyone's a picture taker. All of you are in this room because you have aspirations to do something with your photography. I want you to ask yourself when you're doing something, am I taking pictures or am I actually creating photography? There's a fundamental difference. Fundamental difference. Okay, look at all the people who are on Instagram who are famous, right? Bunch of no talent picture takers. Kendall Jenner, who are all of them, the Kardashians, I mean, they'd take enough to just make you want to throw up. The point I'm trying to make is, guys, when you're, when you're looking at your photography, I want you to ask yourself at all times, are you a picture taker or are you being a photographer? And we're going to go through those differences. Symptoms of a picture taker. Here's where I get in trouble. Picture takers are one trick ponies. Okay? Let's turn on a little bit. Can we turn on a little bit more light? That's fine. Yeah. That's why we turned the light on. So, symptoms of a picture taker. One trick pony. What's a one trick pony? Pony takes one, pony does one thing. Only does one thing, right? You guys see that in the photography industry these days? Yeah. Not just a matter of genre. I'm talking about can they do anything outside of a blown out shot? Why do people blow out shots? Why do we have this? Why do, we have, why do we have this blown out sky tsunami occurring in our industry? Why? It's a very simple answer. Someone said something over here? <laughs> well, that's a little bit more rude than I'd put it, but. <laughs> there you go. So, from a technical standpoint, why do people blow out their skies? They don't understand lighting. <coughs> Say again? They don't understand lighting and how to bring, bring in uh, whether you use natural light or they're just exposing for the person that's in shade as opposed to trying to expose and trying to bring in artificial light and be able to create a background that's blue as opposed to white. Yeah. Um, now, something that people always assume is that I don't like natural light. I love natural light. I just released a video yesterday of me posing a man. In, a, in the Waldo Hotel and using natural light. The entire shoot was natural light. I love natural light. Can you, sh can you get blue skies with natural light? Let me ask you that. Can you get clouds? Can we actually make the earth look like the earth? Okay. So this isn't a matter of you owning a bunch of gear or it's not a matter of you using artificial light. You don't have to use artificial light to get skies. You just have to know what in the freak you're doing. You want to know the simplest way to get skies? Put this on behind you. That's it. I just revealed the secret to the universe. Right? That's how you get fake skies. Put the sun behind you. Shoot that way. That's it, guys. With that one simple change, you can actually have skies in your shots. It really is that simple. Yeah, we have people who, they're trying to make their shots. All they can do is expose for a person's face because they don't understand cameras. This isn't a matter of me hating on newer photographers, younger photographers, you know, a lot of photographers bemoan the, the influx of, of all of you guys, right? I think it's fantastic. I think any time I have an opportunity to speak to a group like you guys, and I can influence some of you to start doing photography in a more comprehensive approach, guess what's going to happen? We're going to raise our rates. You're going to make more money, I'm going to make more money, because our photography will look different than the average Joe's photography. 
That's the freaking problem. Why do we have photographers going bust? There's too many and it's too, it's too mediocre. Put sunglasses on them. <laughs> shoot, shoot, at the, shoot at the magic hour. I, I always tell people, and they think it's the most arrogant statement in the world. It's not an arrogant statement. It's a true statement. I don't take bad shots. It's not because my hands are God. I just refuse to take shots when I know they'd be bad. There's a fundamental difference. I'll be out driving and someone will say, oh, that's a pretty shot. No, it blows. So I don't take it anymore. When I was a newer photographer, I took shots of everything. And then I would think, I would think, I'm going to fix this in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Now I just drive, I'm like, that stinks, not going to take a picture. You need to start thinking and be more selective with what you shoot. It will make a huge difference in your photography, guys. I'm, I'm being very honest with you guys. So a symptom of a picture taker is their stuff looks like everyone else. I was talking about this earlier. You go to the vast majority of wedding photography websites. Couple things to note, go home and do some homework. You don't have to turn it into me, but do it, turn it into yourself. There's no shots in reception halls. There's no shots in dark cere ceremony venues. What do you see? Outside, flowers, trees, blown out skies, lens flare, that's it. 80, 90% of wedding photography, that's what you see. So I said, someone tells me all I shoot is natural light at a wedding. I said, well, what do you do during the reception? I'm always so, that, that perplexes me. What do you do, pray tell? <laughs> I'm pretty damn good at lighting. And I know that unless I'm shooting with the Sony A7S, their faces are going to look like Legos. <laughs> they are. So I'm always curious, and they never send me pictures. Whenever I get online, and I, my wife has banned me from going on to Facebook forums anymore because I just get too hot and bothered, and now I just have to stay off of them. I've pr put a prohibition on myself. Because I ask people, well, show me your shots. And then I'll usually get a few FUs and ever. But it's like, you know, that's my point, guys. You are taking a job from a client, and that job requires you to shoot indoors. How can you possibly, with good conscience, take that job and you can't fulfill the needs of that job? When photographers, wedding photographers, if all you want to do is natural light photography and shoot for a certain thing and that's all you ever want to do, have at it. Seriously. But when it comes down to what you're doing as it relates to your job, if your job set requires you to do that, you need to be able to do it. The bottom line, what I want to convey to you guys is um, you have a job to do. If you can't fulfill that job, you're really, you shouldn't do it. People come to my workshops all the time. I hate flash. Now, I don't mind. I actually, one of the purposes of my workshops is to break the mold and help people to feel comfortable. That's why I do my workshops. And they come, they say, I hate flash. 10 times out of 10, when someone tells me they hate flash, it's because they don't know how to use flash. I don't, ma I don't mock them. They'll come and say, I hate flash. And I'll say, OK, why do you hate flash? Well, it never looks right. OK, why does it never look right? Because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> why do you hate it? Because I don't know how to use it. <laughs> OK, fair enough. I can take that. I can work with that. And then the minute I start showing them just a little bit of flash, it, it, it ama it, their eyes open. They're like, wow, this is what I can do. Guys, photography was meant to be a bunch of different things. Now, again, if you're shooting for your art, for what you love, for what you want to do, you don't want to use flash, don't use it. I don't care. It doesn't bother me if you don't. What I'm telling you, if you take jobs and if you want to be paid, when I spoke to your professor, one of the things he and I spoke about was how you guys can actually make money at photography. Well, guess what? Being a picture taker, you're not going to make money. That's the blunt truth. Might as well just grab an iPhone and just... Let, just let the guests at the wedding do it. Seriously. They'll just post shots and it is what it is. Yeah. Um, of all the weddings that you've taken, you know, obviously it's the happiest day of some couple's lives. But do you ever Sometimes it's the most stressful day. Yeah. Do you ever catch the behind the scenes where the, the bride is to be is freaking out or the groom is like, Ugh, I'm not really into this right now. And one bullet. Pretty much every wedding. Yeah. yeah. I always tell my bride something will go wrong on your wedding day. I will be the most calm, calming influence on that entire wedding day. 
And when the crap hits the fan, I'll put my arm around you and I'll tell you, remember honey, I told you this was gonna happen. <laughs> so we're just moving on from this right now. And they'll always, they'll literally cry to me and say, you're right, you told me this would happen, Jason. I said, let's move on, baby. Yep. At these weddings, do you take pictures of when things go wrong, just to remind them, so they can laugh at It's a great I question. Would, I would. That's I a great would. question. That's a great question. And I'll tell you one thing, I do take pictures to document things. And not just for their purposes, but for mine. Sometimes you'll have people misbehave at a wedding. Yeah. Or they'll make decisions that you know, as a pro, they're going to forget that they made that decision. <laughs> for example, they'll say, Jason, I don't need my couple shoot. I'm good. OK, great. So guess what I do during the time where they're supposed to be doing the couple shoot? I take pictures of them doing shots at the bar. <laughs> so when they're like, why don't we do a couple shoot? Well, honey, you were. Uh. I take pictures of it, I document. The other, the other really good piece of advice I give wedding photographers is take a, take a picture at least every three to five minutes from metadata. I'll have clients, I had clients six years ago say, you guys took a 45 minute break. That was, that was uh, inappropriate. And I looked at the metadata, I said, no, we only took a six minute break. And I went and sat down and showed her every shot. And, oh, I'm sorry. They forget things. So I don't do it in a way to be punitive. I literally just count on the fact they're gonna forget. It, and it does depend on the amount of hours, but yeah. How many of those do you actually deliver to your client once you start sorting through? How many of those 1,500 do you deliver? <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm trying to just tell, tell you guys the truth. The only time I don't deliver a shot is if it's A, redundant. So I don't take bad shots. Because one thing you'll see when I shoot is I take my time. I don't rush. I, I refuse to be rushed. Um, so I, I take my time. So because I take my time, my shots are done appropriately and done correctly. So to answer your question, the only shots that don't get delivered are shots where um, sometimes a flash doesn't fire. So that would be a bad shot. But you know that's the camera's fault. It's recycle time. So uh, I won't deliver those, obviously. I won't deliver shots where there's food in people's mouths or somebody's dress flew up or some guy grabbed some lady somewhere he shouldn't have or stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I'd say out of 1,500, maybe, I don't know, 1,000, 1,100. Because, see, it used to be 3,000, uh, and then I, you know, not only got better as a photographer, but started using better gear, which coincidentally is cheaper gear, which kind of just still throws my mind. Yeah. Out of those 1,100 pictures, what are you editing? Are you editing every pic, or are you just giving them the, the raw? Oh, never give raw. Ever. Don't ever give unedited photos. Again, don't be a picture taker. You want to stand out from the crowd? Edit your shots. I Lightroom all my shots. That's it. Average wedding takes me about four hours to, to edit the entire wedding. So uh, symptoms of a picture taker, I mean, do you find that being more of a learning curve? No, I feel it. We're going to get into it, but I think yeah. picture takers are lazy. I have a big bone to pick with laziness. You know why? You, you guys may be sitting here in the room saying, oh, geez, what a cocky prick, right? What a yeah. jerk. I mean, it makes, I used to shoot in May life uh, four or five years ago. I mean, I was averaging 200 hours a night, four nights a week. Now it's like maybe 25 bucks in free drinks because everybody's doing it. Right. So, so I get what you're saying as far as um, in my nightlife scene. I mean, I was one of like five or six that shot the week, shot clubs every weekend. Right. Making you time great money mm -hmm. two three hours a night shooting artists now there's like 50 people with a camera in the club getting in my way I and mean, their my shots are all over supposed to, where's a flash here a flash here so i get what you're saying about yeah you strap on an a7s your rates will go up because you can shoot without flash. and you can just crank that iso up and you're going to kill them and you're, you're going to make more money all right um Another other symptoms, they follow the pack, there's a lack of understanding, and they plateau. I think that's the, that's the picture takers plateau. That's why 90% of photographers are in that $2,000 range, and they don't break out of it. People ask me that all the time, and then I'll get consultation calls or whatever it might be, and they say, oh, I'm at that, I just, I don't know what it is, I can't get out of that $2,000 range. I, it, I'll look at their photography for 30 seconds, and I know why. They haven't taken the time to learn. I mean, guys, 
when I went into photography, one of the main goals of mine was, you can't say you hate it if you haven't tried it. That's why I tried to show you all the different types of genres that I've shot. And believe it or not, all those different genres, they all meld into one. The reason that my wedding photography has beautiful landscapes and skies is because I'm a landscape photographer at heart. I'm telling you guys, you got to start, don't say you hate it before you try it. It's like going to your kids and your kids are like, oh, I'm not going to eat that. Well, it's really good. You should try it. I'm not going to eat it. I hate it. I hate natural. I hate flash. That's what they're saying. Well, you never know. You might really like it. Now, if you, here's what I tell people, and I mean this sincerely. If you really can do it and you still say, I don't like it, I don't want to shoot it, I respect you, truly, because at least you know what you're talking about. But you can't say you don't like it if you haven't tried it. Next slide. Okay, so why are there so many picture takers? We've spoken about some of this. There's the fear of the unknown, right? Again, we fear what we don't know. Digital photography, right? And now mirrorless has only exacerbated the problem. Thank you, Sony, for making, every, making it easy for everyone to get a shot. Because quite frankly, I get that all the time on my videos. Sony makes it too easy, so it's not really photography. Right? So digital photography has made it easy for everyone to enter. And what happened years and years ago? Film photographers bemoaned the fact that so many digital photographers were entering the market. And instead of those, some, a good majority of them, instead of those film photographers learning and adapting, what they did was they cried about it and whined about it and moaned about it and then they lost their business because they refused to adapt. And that's what I tell people about mirrorless right now. I don't care about what brand it is. I'm telling you guys. You're not going to, when you can carry something that's a third of the weight and a third of the cost, eventually the market, the market's going to break. It will. I'm just telling you. When you shoot as much as I do, I do maybe three to four shoots a week. Right? I'm not a scrawny guy. I'm not Frodo Baggins over here. Okay? But guess what? F-R-O-D-O. Just as Lord of the Rings. But what I'm trying to tell you guys is, but I'm not the strongest guy in the world either, but I'm telling you when you're lifting that camera day in, day out, and you're taking 500, 1,000 shots, you know, how many, you know how many older photographers complain about tennis elbow? They complain about those things. You guys ever had two bodies on you, you look like Rambo, one here, one here. I, I don't care how big and strong you are, by the end of your night, your back aches. It aches. I don't feel them at all. I seriously I walk around and I'm like, do I have my camera on me? I'm like, oh, there it is. Not a sales pitch. I'm just telling you guys, regardless of the brand, that's the way the industry is going to go. And film, film cameras were small, right? For the most part, film cameras were small. Digital went, it's going to go back. So think about that. Again, lack of training and a lack of dedication. Again, the shots are good enough. I think that's the main issue here, is there's a real lack of Lack of dedication to learn. Again, I don't, I want to make something abundantly clear. Just because you, doesn't, you don't know it doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. I am in no way making fun of photographers not knowing something. I have a problem with those who refuse to learn. Who refuse to learn. Who, who, who start their photography journey and they get into it 20% of the way. Their shots get good enough for them to start making money and then they quit. That was, that was preemptive, but whatever. Um, but I, that's what I want to get into with you guys. So what is a photographer? What's the difference between a photographer and a picture taker? Hmm? He knows what he's doing. Hmm? He knows what he's doing, and he knows what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. He knows where to find a shot. Exactly. The photographer makes you part of that moment, draws the viewer into the moment, and makes you part of that scene. Right. Tells a story. Tells a story. I think a great photograph, even when I'm reviewing mine, when I know that I have one that I want to share on a presentation rather than one that I just, okay, I took it. I think a picture should make you ask a question. A picture, you should look at a picture and like, hmm, what was, what was happening? Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's what a great photograph does. So next slide. So it's impossible for any photographer on this planet to know everything. I definitely am included in that. I don't know everything. But a great photographer has a mastery of the fundamentals. 
They really should. You know, the biggest fear that I had when I was a newer photographer was I had a fear of a, of a client coming to me and saying, hey, I want you to do this. This was my biggest fear. Coming to me and saying, I want you to do this. And I'd be like, I, have no, I don't know how to do that. So what did I do when I was a newer photographer? I booked so many free shoots, it'd make your head spin. I was doing two to three free shoots a week. You go on to modelmayhem.com, you get a model, and you ask him to shoot. I cannot tell you how many times, Joyce and I still do it, we'll just walk, we'll see a pretty girl, handsome guy, and say, here's my business card, I want to shoot you. And I go try some funky, crazy new concept that I want to try. How did I learn posing? I butchered it until I got it right. But I butchered it on free shoots. Yeah? What's your take on YouTube videos tutorials on photography? They're horrible. No one should go on YouTube. That's a joke, because I'm big on YouTube. Like tutorials on how to shoot them, what's your take on I know you have some also, but what should be your key points of looking at this is a video I should watch, or I should like disregard this video? Okay, disregard most videos that are not real world application. One of the main reasons I do the videos in the manner that I do is because the vast majority of photography videos out there are fake. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'm not going to mention any names, but when you look at a lot of the photography videos, they'll set it up and they'll do a shoot that takes them 10 to 20 minutes of setting up. And they'll say, this is what you would do on a wedding. No way you're going to do that on a wedding. Not a chance. That's one of the main reasons I started filming all of my sh real shoots. Just wanted to say, hey, this is what it looks like, good, bad, and ugly. This is exactly what it looks like because I want you guys to see that's the pace of the shoot, that's how we do the shoot, so on and so forth. Because that's what's the most critical part, is you guys understanding what a real shoot looks like. So when you're looking for videos, if it's in some staged area, I mean, I, I, that's one thing I hate about all these photography learners. They tell you these ideal situations. Well, let me just break it down to you. It's never ideal. It's never ideal. There's never enough time. There's never enough gear. <laughs> There's never enough batteries, memory cards. There's just, it's not there. Unless you're getting paid $150,000 to do a commercial shoot and you have assistants at your beck and call, it just doesn't happen. I have assistants now. I didn't for the vast majority of my career. First six, seven years of it, I didn't have any assistants. I learned to manage on my own. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is, as it relates to looking for learning situations, do something, look for something that's actually real. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you click on a video and you're like, who's going to do this? Now maybe you guys can't discern that. Maybe, I'm sure most, most of you can. But if, you, if you're having a trouble uh, discerning whether or not that would be a real world application, just watch it for a few minutes and like, okay, there's no way he's going to do this on a shoot. Maybe a portrait shoot, that you'd have more time. But even a portrait shoot, think about it. Even a portrait shoot, you're charging for your time. So a normal sitting time is going to be an hour, 90 minutes. So if he's spending all this time setting up and doing all this stuff, it's not really going to happen on a real shoot. So in other words, they're, you know, it's like when I tell people, what, when they ask me what workshop should I go to, well, of course I say you should come to mine. I want to make money, right? That's why I say that. But I also say that because when you look at workshops, they'll set it up. They'll put soft boxes in, in places. They'll give you the triggers. They'll send you around. You'll go get great shots. You'll go back and say, oh, that was a wonderful workshop. You have no idea how you captured that shot. There's not in a million years you could go back and recreate it. My workshops, you come on, I hand you gear and say, go do it. I'll stand by you. I'll help you. When you get stuck, I'll help you. But I want you to actually come away from my workshop, and I want you to be able to go back and recreate that shot on your own. That's the learning that occurs. You don't learn anything when you just steal my shot. Does that make sense? So when you're watching those videos or doing those things, I want you to say, is, is this something that would really happen? That, that's, that's, that's critical, guys. Um, again, a photographer has a variety of looks and techniques. They have a very distinctive brand. Um, a photographer doesn't plateau. Now you know how to stop uh, plateauing or being, becoming stagnant? How do you do that? Say again? Exactly. I did weddings for a couple years and I was getting bored. Ugh. I was feeling that wedding fatigue. Ugh. Shooting 30, 40 weddings a year. I hate this, right? So I told my wife, I'm going to start doing pinup shoots. Why? Because I'm bored. Well, you don't know how to do pinups. So what? Figure it out. I'll butcher it until I get it right. 
right? Then I started doing all the other things that, so the bottom line is I started challenging myself. Like I said in the video, break your, breaking your comfort zone, guys. It's about you guys getting out there and really challenging yourself. And what you're going to find, like I mentioned earlier, is that when you start to attack these different areas of photography, you're going you're gonna to put them into your, whatever your main uh, area of photography is. I use pinup poses on my brides. They love it. They look sexy. They look attractive. You know, it's funny because one of the poses, and I'll look ridiculous doing it, of course, but you know, yeah, get it, baby. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a girl will put her foot, foot together and bend that knee over. It's very, very feminine, right? Now, a, a bride is wearing a wedding dress, so you might think that that wouldn't have any application because she's covered up. The bottom line is when she, I, I found after I did the pinups, when she brought that knee out, it pulled the dress forward, it slimmed her. It's a simple technique I learned just from doing pinups. So what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, and I capture, you know, I always, w I always knew how to capture my sky. So when I wanted to put a bride in front of it and capture the sky, I started adding light. People say my work is HDR. I don't do HDR, I just light. I use lighting. Does that make sense, guys? That's what I really want you guys to, to be thinking about when you're, when you're forming your own, um, your own brand. And I think a photographer makes an impact. Yeah? Nope. Yeah. What? What? Our joke is it's not HDR, it's GSY, which means go screw yourself. <laughs> 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 no, it's not HDR. How do you do it? I just told you, brother. <laughs> you expose for the sky, plus you can pay me and come to my workshop. But <laughs> you expose for the sky and you use appropriate lighting on your subject. Bracketing? Nope. Bracketing is HDR. Yeah, you tried to trick me. It's not going to work. <laughs> fake sky, my fake sky is right. Yeah, go ahead. And I don't Photoshop those in. I sh my wife tells me, stop saying fake skies. People are going to believe it. But anyway, go ahead. But the workshop is like on a certain day, right? So, uh, for example, on that day, there's no cloud. There's no cloud in the sky. I can always find a cloud. You can always put one in, too. No. No? No. Shame on you. <laughs> no, don't put, don't, be, be a photographer. Don't be a graphic designer. If, if that's what you want to be. If you want to be a graphic designer, be a graphic designer. I have no problem with graphic designers. But if you're talking about being a photographer, be a photographer. So, um, when, yeah, sometimes there are, there's no sky, right? But it, there are no clouds, right? Yeah. But get something blue. Make sure it's blue. Now, yeah, say again. Clouds all go east. Yeah. You can go east and you'll find clouds. Yeah, just. There's no water. Joyce will tell you how many times I'll chase the clouds. <laughs> like a storm watcher, storm chaser. I'll, I'll drive everyone nuts. Like the clouds are over there, that's where we're going. Oh my gosh, that's so far. Get in the car, let's go. Because I want the clouds. I, I refuse to take a bad shot. If the shot blows, I don't take it. Sure, I would. Absolutely. Absolutely, I would. Okay. Absolutely. I just want definition to my shots. Sometimes overcast shots can be incredible. Oh. Yeah. I mean, like a real broody, kind of moody feel. It doesn't have to be happy and cheerful. It can be. But I just, want you, I just want you guys to capture something. I mean, even with the lighting techniques that I use, you know, I took a bride and groom out to Laguna Beach. It was their wedding day. Huge amount of fog came in. I exposed for the fog. You might say, how in the heck do you expose for fog? Well, you, you put your metering on the, the exposure for the fog. That's all you guys do is you expose for the brightest part in the sky. That's it. There's your HDR secret, right? You expose for the brightest part of the sky. And then what you do is you take your light and you illuminate your subject. That's it. It really is as simple as that. Now it takes time to learn, it takes time to perfect, but what I'm telling you is it's possible. My shots are not HDR. And then like I said, photographers make an impact. I, you know, one of the things that I really want to, wanted to start doing was to do work that just didn't benefit me. I wanted to do something, like I said, I wanted to leave, leave a legacy, and not just, oh, look how 
popular I am or whatever it might be. I wanted to do something like I work with Out of the Ashes, so we go to Ethiopia and we help really to, to take photography that pulls these kids out of, they eat at the dump, they live at the dump. And uh, the first year we did it, which was last year, um, once we released that video, their fundraising, it like quintupled. It was crazy the amount of money they started getting in, just because of a simple video. So when you do get into a position where you can make a difference, make a difference. Do something with your life, yeah. How does one find those type of, uh, those type of shoes, that type of work as far as traveling to other countries? Is it just knowing somebody or being at the right place at the wrong time? We're going to get into that. Um, I'm going to move through the presentation, but we're going to get into that um, because um, it's all about preparing yourself when that moment occurs. See, here's what I want to convey to you guys more than anything. You will get opportunities. The, the real question is, are you going to blow them? You know, what's the tagline on my company? You guys hear me say at the end of every video, you only have one chance to get it right. If you live by that, I live by that. So when I take a shot or when I'm in a situation, I'm like, this is it, do or die, never going to happen again. Never going to happen again. I tell myself, this is, you're never going to come back here. Like when I went, I went into Six Flags, right? You're never going to come back here. Well, I went in there three more times. But <laughs> we still have another video coming out where I was playing with the alligators in there. But the bottom line, guys, is live by that. Live by you only have one chance to get it right. Um, it'll affect your photography. It'll affect the way you approach your photography. It really, really will. All right, next slide. How to become a photographer. Next slide. Stop being lazy. Vast majority of people, hi, are not photographers because they're lazy, right? What did we talk about earlier? They just, they just run around, they take pictures, they refuse to learn. So out of a raise of hands, and I'm certainly not going to make fun of you, I'm just curious, who here, if you're willing to raise your hand, who here doesn't feel comfortable using your flash? What, what should you do? Who, who here does not have or own an external flash? Same group. <laughs> my, my homework for you guys, borrow, don't steal, but borrow or beg, lo rent, loan, whatever it might be, a flash and start playing with it. Other key recommendation how I get my skies, don't shoot in TTL. TTL will fail you. <laughs> sure, TTL. If you expose for the background, TTL is taking that into consideration so it's not going to properly meter for your subject. TTL is just automatic on your flash. That's all it is. Now, you guys might be scared. Just hang on. Don't forget it. Uh, you guys might be scared of using manual on your flash. You don't figure out what all those stupid mathematical equations, it doesn't matter what they mean. I, could, I don't even know what they mean. Okay? It's, all you know is 1 to 1 is the most powerful. <laughs> and 1 to 1 28th is the least. And you move the flash up and down. It's super, super hard. You move the flash up and down until it looks right. Now they're just fractions. 1 to 1 means full power. 1 at 1 28th means, well, 1 at 1 28th. The bottom line is you guys need to Start playing with that flash, okay? If, if you guys use it in TTL, again, that's laziness. Laziness. Stop being lazy, please. Do you use rear curtain? Sometimes. Sometimes. What's rear curtain? Just kidding. But uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, rear curtain is when you fire, the, the flash fires at the end of the, the shutter, and that's a way to freeze frame your subject. So, but yeah, I mean, it depends. If I'm shooting a longer shutter, I'll use rear curtain. These are all stuff that we work on, on, on the workshops, by the way, www.jasonlinearworkshops.com. Yeah. <coughs> Go back to the shot, please, please. The next shot right there is, is that's not flash. That's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a sexy guy right there. I don't know about that part. I'm not going to say about that. But that shot, long exposure, with what camera are you shooting that with? Uh, one of my workshop attendees shot that. <laughs> but. I'm, this is in Chicago, and I was shooting, and she says, hey, I want to grab a cool production shot of you, so she shot that. So, but I don't know, I, because I didn't shoot it, I think it's, I don't know. But even this, this is probably, you know, 40th of a second. You know, I always tell my, my uh, students don't shoot lower than a 60th of a second handheld. With the Sony A7 Mark II, you can shoot at a 6th of a second handheld, because of the image stabilization. Yeah. What percentage of your, of your income is based on that you sell, opposed to... Mm, 1%. Okay. So it's mostly just a pen. 
That's the past, guys. That's the past. That's the past. You can witch and moan about it all you want. What do your clients want images for? Facebook, blogs, iPads, phones, text messages. It's what they want. And we're fighting it. Guess what I did? I just started charging for it. I just built it into my rates. Stupidest thing you can do is say, well, if you want all the images, it's going to cost you an extra two grand. Oh, I don't want that. But if you think about it smart, you build it into the price. Now I just get paid for my time. If my clients don't buy a single thing after the wedding or after the portrait shoot, I don't care. I'm the least pushy salesman you'll find. A lot of times they'll be like, hey, Jason, did you want to do it? Did you want me to order an album? And I'm like, oh, sure, yeah, you can do that. Because my business is about pr providing a very, very high quality product in a very quick amount of time. Because I, I chose to build my business to where um, I'm flying all over the world. I don't have time to cater to 50 brides and 50 albums. I don't. I don't want to do that. I don't want my life to be fulfilling orders, right? I used to use Pictage. I hate them now because they stink. But you know, you go on to um, Smug Mug or Zenfolio or whatever it might be. Just have them fulfill the orders for you guys. So it's worth its weight in gold. Put your pictures up. Your clients order them. If they have a problem with the print, my clients will call me up. And it's only happened once or twice in six, seven years. Hey, Jason, I didn't like that print. Awesome. Call Pictage. That's, that's what I pay them to do. Also, if you do that, then you know it, when you send them images, and if they get them printed at Costco or Walmart and they look like garbage, you can say, well, that's why I provide you a professional lab. And I tell my clients, unless you're the most vain person in the world, unless you're Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, Okay, you're only going to hang three or four images up in your house. Truly. Have those blunt conversations with your clients. I tell them, you're, you're only going to print three or four. Order them through the lab so they look fantastic. And I tell them, I'm not making a ton of money off it, which I'm not. You know, 8 by 10 is, I don't know, $10, 15 bucks, whatever it might be. I may make 40% of that. So when you think about it, and, I, and when you talk to them in those terms, see, they're basing everything off of, well, an 8 by 10 at Walmart is $3. Yeah, that's three dollars of garbage. But if I say, hey, you're going to buy four prints, four 16 by 20s might cost you hundred dollars. What's hundred dollars to have beautiful prints up in your house? And when you talk to them in those terms, they're like, yeah, you're right. You know, an album may be between eight hundred to two thousand dollars. Albums can be lucrative. I should do more of them, but I just prefer to be exploring an abandoned building. Yep. What file format do you deliver to? JPEG. Never raw. Don't give away your raw. Dumb idea. Someone can manipulate your work and then it's gone. Question, yeah. Question. Um, do you ever give full size? Do you, if not, what size do you give? Yeah, usually I'll, I'll put it about 85, 90%. If I give them 60%, what's going to happen? They're going to call me two, three months down the road. Oh, I printed it and it's just, it's not high res enough. Or the printer told me it's not high. Now I'm going back and forth and back. Which file is it? Which this? Which that? I don't want to do that. I want my business to be efficient. See, photographers don't really think of what they do as a business. They think of it only as an art form, and that's where they fail. You have to have two hats, the artist and the business person. So building a distinct look and brand, right? People hire me simply because my work looks different, right? They want their wedding to look different. I just uh, sold a wedding yesterday. And I flat out told him, I said, if you, want your, if you want your work to be shot by a Sony artisan or imagery, I'm only one of 20 some odd in the world. If you want your work to look different, you hire me. You pay me more money. And that's, those are the conversations I have at a consultation. It's, I'm certainly polite and, and nice to them, but I'm, I'm bold, guys. You got to be bold when you're selling yourself. Don't say, well, you know, you know maybe if you choose me, you know. Hem and haw, hem and haw. No one's going to choose you. You're a wimp. <laughs> Seriously. I just flat out tell them, look, I'm one of 20 in the world. If you want to tell people that, and believe me, your clients will love it. You start winning awards and doing things, your clients, they'll go around, ooh, I have a Sony Artisan Imager shoot in my wedding. Now, they love it. You guys may think that's hogwash. They love it. Okay? But they, want, but they also hire me because my shots look different. Way before I was an artisan of imagery, it was about my work looking different. 
And they, they would say to me all the time, and they still, to, still do to this day, I don't want to get my wedding images, and it looks like all my girlfriend's wedding images. They'll flat out tell me, I want it to blow their crap out of the water. And they do. And then when they take their images to the office, I get the calls from the office people who see the images and say, oh my gosh, I just saw the images. I want you to shoot my wedding. You're not going to do that if all your shots are blown out. Everyone does it. Picture takers. Okay. You know what the difference is? A picture taker is a fry cook. A photographer is a chef. That's the difference. Have you ever been offered a job that you felt you weren't ready for? Absolutely. Pretty much every job I took, I wasn't ready for, and I did anyway. Because I am a risk taker. I say in my video, be a risk taker. <coughs> right? First, the first, my first wedding, I had no idea what I was doing. When I was hired to do my first wedding, I shot an auto. I had a Fuji S3 Pro. I had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, my biggest fear was... You know, it's funny, when I used to take pictures with my cameras, I would take them and I would just put them on a tripod and hope it turned out, is to be honest with you. And then, I was terrified of somebody asking me for my settings because I'm like, I would pretend that I knew what I was talking about when I had no idea, I didn't even know what an f-stop was, right? I mean, I didn't even know what shutter or ISO did, film speed, I had no idea. So the bottom line is, I, you know, I took jobs, but once I took a job, I would say, okay, I took this job, I need to prepare for this job. You know, I'd ask myself, can I prepare to, to be ready for it? But you guys, if you're, if you're afraid of the future, you're never going to get ahead. You can't fear it, guys. Jump in. Go ahead. A question. Uh, when you get a job, as far as the locations, do they tell you this is where I want it? Or do you offer locations? I tell them this is where your shots are not going to suck. <laughs> so I'll have clients say, I want to have my portrait, or I want to have my engagement shots done at Balboa Park at 1 p.m. Okay, great. Shots are going to blow. <laughs> High noon, raccoon eyes, sweat. And, and guess what? If my clients push, which sometimes they do, well, that's the only time we can do it. We have to do it at 1. When, they, when they're sweating, I will say to them, this is why I told you to do that. I don't try to be an I told you so, but I'm reminding them because they're going to get those pictures back. Say, geez, I'm all beady. Can you do something with that in Photoshop? Nope. I make all my models. They can't wear bras. Not because I'm trying to make it sexy. I am not going to Photoshop the bra straps out. Absolutely not. I've ended shoots. I'll just be like, nope, I'm not shooting. Don't, don't make more work for yourself, guys. I mean, you might think it's crazy, but if they're, you know, well, I'll leave that alone. But... <laughs> <laughs> There's only two video cameras rolling. But the bottom line is, guys, um, you guys have to always think along those lines. Are you making, is, I will sit there, they'll tell you, I'll sit there on a shoot, I'll kind of survey it and say, uh, take, take one minute to look at it. I'll literally do this. I'll, I, I purposely don't have my camera under my hands. And I'll go like this and I'm like, okay, do I like everything that I see here? And now it's 30 seconds. But if there's trash, if there, I, when I walk into a bridal room, I tell them I won't shoot until all, everything is cleaned up. Oh, can you help me clean up? No, I won't. I'm not being hired to clean up somebody's underwear and in and out wrappers. I'm not. So I tell them I don't come and I don't start shooting until it's clean. So if I show up and it's a disaster, which happens 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I say, hey, sweetie, why don't you give me your shoes and your bouquet? I'm going to start doing some detail shots while you guys clean up. And then they'll sometimes try to task my assistants and say, OK, well, can your guy do this? And I say, no, I need them. But you let me know when you're ready. Uh, yeah? Speaking of more work and assistance, do you bring uh, other gear like diffusers and reflectors with you? Absolutely. Say, you know, I want you to one or two of yeah. So flashes, your diffusers, reflectors, you know, guys, no, you know, I always say you should be like a Terminator. You should go through and, doot, 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 and survey the scenario and say this is the best possible um, lighting. This is the best possible, these are the best tools that I should use to shoot this. You should be able to decipher that. Not at first, it took me time, but you should be able to walk into a scenario and decipher what that situation requires. That is when you're actually a photographer. Seriously, that's the mastery of the fundamentals.